Good Tuesday to you all, and welcome to this 10th day of January. It is day number 10 in our journey through the Bible. Hello to everyone out there. My name is Hunter, and I am your brother, your Bible reading coach, someone who shows up with you every day to spend a little time together in the pages of the Bible. We're going to let the Bible do what the Bible does and direct our hearts to the one who is the living Word of God, the one alone who has the words of life. If you're new here to this podcast, I want to welcome you. We are glad you are here. Make yourself at home and prepare to do a couple of things. One is to read through the entire Bible, the Old Testament once and the New Testament twice here in 2023. But more than that, our desire, our prayer, is that day by day, we will experience the love of God. We will step into the reality of what really is, and that reality is God's love for you and for this whole world. And from this place of love, we will move into our day with grace and kindness and peace and joy. So, prepare your heart today to receive. Today we're going to look into the book of Genesis. It's chapters 25 and 26, then Psalm 6, and we'll finish in Luke's Gospel, chapter 10. This is the word of the Lord. Genesis 25. Abraham married another wife whose name was Keturah. She gave birth to Zimran, Jokshan, Midan, Midian, Ishbak, and Shua. Jokshan was the father of Sheba and Dedan. Dedan's descendants were the Ashurites, Letushites, and Limoites. Midian's sons were Ephah, Epher, Henoch, Abida, and Elda. These were all descendants of Abraham through Keturah. Abraham gave everything he owned to his son Isaac. But before he died, he gave gifts to the sons of his concubines and sent them off to a land in the east, away from Isaac. Abraham lived for 175 years, and he died at a ripe old age. Having lived a long and satisfying life, he breathed his last and joined his ancestors in death. His sons Isaac and Ishmael buried him in the cave of Machpelah near Mamre in the field of Ephron, son of Zohar of the Hittite. This was the field Abraham had purchased from the Hittites, and where he had buried his wife Sarah. After Abraham's death, God blessed his son Isaac, who settled near Beer Larohai in the Negev. This is the account of the family of Ishmael, the son of Abraham, through Hagar, Sarah's Egyptian servant. Here is a list, by their names and clans, of Ishmael's descendants. The oldest was Naboeth, followed by Kedar, Abdiel, Mibsam, Mishma, Duma, Masa, Hadad, Tima, Jetur, Nafish, and Kedema. These twelve sons of Ishmael became the founders of twelve tribes named after them, listed according to the places they settled and camped. Ishmael lived for 137 years. Then he breathed his last and joined his ancestors in death. Ishmael's descendants occupied the region of Havilah, Tashur, which is east of Egypt, in the direction of Ashur. There they lived in open hostility toward all their relatives. This is the account of the family of Isaac, the son of Abraham. When Isaac was forty years old, he married Rebekah, the daughter of Bethuel, the Aramean from Padan Aram, and the sister of Laban, the Aramean. Isaac pleaded with the Lord on behalf of his wife because she was unable to have children. The Lord answered Isaac's prayer, and Rebekah became pregnant with twins. But the two children struggled with each other in her womb, so she went to ask the Lord about it. Why is this happening to me, she asked. And the Lord told her, The sons in your womb will become two nations. From the very beginning, the two nations will be rivals. One nation will be stronger than the other, and your older son will serve your younger son. And when the time came to give birth, Rebekah discovered that she did indeed have twins. The first one was very red at birth, and covered with thick hair like a fur coat, so they named him Esau. Then the other twin was born with his hand grasping Esau's heel, so they named him Jacob. Isaac was sixty years old when the twins were born. 
As the boys grew up, Esau became a skillful hunter. He was an outdoorsman, but Jacob had a quiet temperament, preferring to stay at home. Isaac loved Esau because he enjoyed eating the wild game Esau brought home. But Rebekah loved Jacob. One day when Jacob was cooking some stew, Esau arrived home from the wilderness, exhausted and hungry. Esau said to Jacob, I'm starved. Give me some of that red stew. This is how Esau got his other name, Edom, which means red. All right, Jacob replied. But trade me your rights as the firstborn son. Look, I'm dying of starvation, said Esau. What good is my birthright to me now? But Jacob said, First you must swear that your birthright is mine. So Esau swore an oath, thereby selling all his rights as the firstborn to his brother Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau some bread and lentil stew. Esau ate the meal, then got up and left, and showed contempt for his rights as the firstborn. Genesis 26 A severe famine now struck the land, as had happened before in Abraham's time. So Isaac moved to Gerar, where Abimelech, king of the Philistines, lived. The Lord appeared to Isaac and said, Do not go down to Egypt, but do as I tell you. Live here as a foreigner in this land, and I will be with you and bless you. I hereby confirm that I will give all these lands to you and your descendants, just as I solemnly promised Abraham your father. I will cause your descendants to become as numerous as the stars of the sky, and I will give them all these lands, and through your descendants, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. I will do this because Abraham listened to me and obeyed all my requirements, commands, decrees, and instructions. So Isaac stayed in Gerar. When the men who lived there asked Isaac about his wife, Rebekah, he said, She is my sister. He was afraid to say, She is my wife. He thought they would kill me to get her because she is so beautiful. But sometime later, Abimelech, king of the Philistines, looked out his window and saw Isaac caressing Rebekah. Immediately, Abimelech called for Isaac and exclaimed, She is obviously your wife. Why did you say she is my sister? Because I was afraid someone would kill me to get her from me, Isaac replied. How could you do this to us? Abimelech exclaimed. One of my people might easily have taken your wife and slept with her, and you would have made us guilty of great sin. Then Abimelech issued a public proclamation. Anyone who touches this man or his wife will be put to death. When Isaac planted his crops that year, he harvested a hundred times more grain than he had planted. For the Lord blessed him. He became a very rich man, and his wealth continued to grow. He acquired so many flocks of sheep and goats, herds of cattle, and servants, that the Philistines became jealous of him. So the Philistines filled up all of Isaac's wells with dirt. These were the wells that he had dug by the servants of his father Abraham. Finally, Abimelech ordered Isaac to leave the country. Go somewhere else, he said, for you have become too powerful for us. So Isaac moved away to the Gerar Valley, where he set up their tents and settled down. He reopened the wells his father had dug, which the Philistines had filled in after Abraham's death. Isaac also restored the names Abraham had given them. Isaac's servants also dug in the Gerar Valley and discovered a well of fresh water. But then the shepherds from Gerar came and claimed the spring. This is our water, they said, and they argued over it with Isaac's herdsmen. So Isaac named the well Esek, which means argument. Isaac's men then dug another well. But again there was a dispute over it, so Isaac named it Sitna, which means hostility. Abandoning that one, Isaac moved on and dug another well. This time there was no dispute over it, so Isaac named the place Rehoabath, which means open space, for he said, At last the Lord has created enough space for us to prosper in this land. From there Isaac moved to Beersheba, where the Lord appeared to him on the night of his arrival. I am the God of your father Abraham, he said. Do not be afraid, for I am with you and will bless you. I will multiply your descendants, and they will become a great nation. I will do this because of my promise to Abraham, my servant. Then Isaac built an altar there and worshipped the Lord. He set up his camp at that place, and his servants dug another well. One day, King Abimelech came from Gerar with his advisors, Ahuzath, and also Phil called his army commander. Why have you come here? Isaac asked. You obviously hate me since you kicked me off your land. They replied, We can plainly see that the Lord is with you. 
so we want to enter into a sworn treaty with you. Let's make a covenant. Swear that you will not harm us, just as we have never troubled you. We have always treated you well, and we sent you away from us in peace, and now look how the Lord has blessed you. So Isaac prepared a covenant feast to celebrate the treaty, and they ate and drank together. Early the next morning they each took a solemn oath not to interfere with each other. Then Isaac sent them home again, and they left him in peace. That very day Isaac's servants came and told him about a new well they had dug. We found water, they exclaimed. So Isaac named the well Sheba, which means oath. And to this day the town that grew up there is called Beersheba, which means well of the oath. At the age of forty, Esau married two Hittite wives, Judith, the daughter of Beri, and Basmath, the daughter of Elon. But Esau's wives made life miserable for Isaac and Rebekah. Psalm 6 For the choir director, a psalm of David to be accompanied by an eight-stringed instrument. O Lord, don't rebuke me in your anger, or discipline me in your rage, Have compassion on me, Lord, for I am weak. Heal me, Lord, for my bones are in agony. I am sick at heart. How long, O Lord, until you restore me? Return, O Lord, and rescue me. Save me because of your unfailing love. For the dead do not remember you. Who can praise you from the grave? I am worn out from sobbing. All night I flood my bed with weeping, drenching it with my tears. My vision is blurred by grief. My eyes are worn out because of all my enemies. Go away, all you who do evil. For the Lord has heard my weeping. The Lord has heard my plea. The Lord will answer my prayer. May all my enemies be disgraced and terrified. May they suddenly turn back in shame. Luke 10. The Lord now chose 72 other disciples and sent them ahead in pairs to all the towns and places he planned to visit. These were his instructions to them. The harvest is great, but the workers are few. So pray to the Lord who is in charge of the harvest. Ask him to send more workers into his fields. Now go, and remember that I am sending you out as lambs among wolves. Don't take any money with you, nor a traveler's bag, nor an extra pair of sandals, and don't stop to greet anyone on the road. Whenever you enter someone's home, say first, May God's peace be on this house. If those who live there are peaceful, the blessing will stand. If they are not, the blessing will return to you. Don't move around from home to home. Stay in one place, eating and drinking what they provide. Don't hesitate to accept hospitality because those who work deserve their pay. If you enter a town and it welcomes you, eat whatever is set before you. Heal the sick and tell them the kingdom of God is near you. But if a town refuses to welcome you, go out into the streets and say, We wipe even the dust of your town from our feet to show that we have abandoned you to your fate. And know this, the kingdom of God is near. I assure you, even wicked Sodom will be better off than such a town on Judgment Day. What sorrow awaits you, Chorazin and Bethsaida? For if the miracles I did in you had been done in wicked Tyre and Sidon, their people would have repented of their sins long ago, clothing themselves in burlap and throwing ashes on their heads to show their remorse. Yes, Tyre and Sidon will be better off on Judgment Day than you. And you people of Capernaum, will you be honored in heaven? No, you will go down to the place of the dead. Then he said to the disciples, Anyone who accepts your message is also accepting me, and anyone who rejects you is rejecting me, and anyone who rejects me is rejecting God who sent me. When the seventy-two disciples returned, they joyfully reported to him, Lord, even the demons obeyed us when we used your name. Yes, he told them, I saw Satan fall from heaven like lightning. Look, I have given you authority over all the power of the enemy, and you can walk among snakes and scorpions and crush them. Nothing will injure you. But don't rejoice because evil spirits obey you. Rejoice because your names are registered in heaven. At that same time, Jesus was filled with the joy of the Holy Spirit, and he said, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, thank you for hiding these things from those who think themselves wise and clever and for revealing them to the childlike yes father it pleased you to do it this way my father has entrusted everything to me no one truly knows the son except the father and no one truly knows the father except the son and those to whom the son chooses to reveal him then when they were alone he turned to the disciples and said 
Blessed are the eyes that see what you have seen. I tell you, many prophets and kings longed to see what you see, but they didn't see it. And they longed to hear what you hear, but they didn't hear it. One day, an expert in religious law stood up to test Jesus by asking him this question. Teacher, what should I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus replied, What does the law of Moses say? How do you read it? The man answered, You must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your strength, all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. Right, Jesus told him. Do this and you will live. The man wanted to justify his actions, so he asked Jesus, And who is my neighbor? Jesus replied with a story. A Jewish man was traveling from Jerusalem down to Jericho, and he was attacked by bandits. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him up, and left him half dead beside the road. By chance, a priest came along, but when he saw the man lying there, he crossed to the other side of the road and passed him by. A temple assistant walked over and looked at him lying there, and he also passed by on the other side. Then a despised Samaritan came along, and when he saw the man, he felt compassion for him. Going over to him, the Samaritan soothed his wounds with olive oil and wine and bandaged them. Then he put the man on his own donkey and took him to an inn, where he took care of him. The next day he handed the innkeeper two silver coins, telling him, Take care of this man. If his bill runs higher than this, I'll pay you the next time I'm here. Now which of these three would you say was a neighbor to the man who was attacked by the bandits? Jesus asked. The man replied, The one who showed him mercy. Then Jesus said, Yes. Now go and do the same. As Jesus and the disciples continued on their way to Jerusalem, they came to a certain village where a woman named Martha welcomed them into her home. Her sister Mary sat at the Lord's feet, listening to what he taught. But Martha was distracted by the big dinner she was preparing. She came to Jesus and said, Lord, does it seem unfair to you that my sister just sits there while I do all the work? Tell her to come and help me. But the Lord said to her, My dear Martha, you are worried and upset over all these details. There's only one thing worth being concerned about. Mary has discovered it, and it will not be taken away from her. And now, Lord, will you help us to discover it? We come and sit at your feet. Help us to see. And give your blessing to the reading of this word. Amen. Jesus is telling a secret, and he's thrilled at the thought of it. This is what he says in Luke 10, verse 21. Jesus was filled with joy of the Holy Spirit, and he said, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, thank you for hiding these things from those who think themselves wise and clever and revealing them to the childlike. Yes, it pleased you to do it this way. This secret filled the Father and fills the Son with great joy. So what's a secret? The secret is him. Jesus is the way to God, the way to life, what every heart is looking for. He is the King, and He is proclaiming the kingdom. Jesus is the secret to it all. It's not the law. It's not traditions or piety. No, the secret is living in the name, in the power, in the presence of God. The God who's with us, who's for us. 72 people are sent out two by two in Jesus' name. And notice what he tells them not to take with them. No bag, no money, no staff, no nothing. The only thing they are equipped with is his name, the name of Jesus. The with God life is not going to be found through our resources, our money, our staff, our provisions. No, it's only going to be found in him. So he has them take nothing except his name, his message, his blessing, his presence to the world. 
This is the With God Life, a life of utter reliance on God, being available to His presence and His agenda. When we do that, we end up fulfilling the law. We will be the people of mercy that we read about later on in this story with the Good Samaritan. We will be fulfilling the law. We will be participating with Christ himself. It'll be Christ, his power, the power of his name. It will be him working in and through us. We won't be the hero. It'll be Christ in us. And that's the secret. His presence in you, which Paul says is your hope and your glory. So let's live in the reality of the secret of Christ in you. Let's awaken to the wonder of what it is to step out into the day simply in his name. Not striving, not pushing, sweating, fretting over what you think you need to do. Your real life is hidden with God in Christ. Your truest self, the self that is learning more and more of what it is to love God, to love your neighbor, to love yourself. Today we can walk with him, eyes and ears wide open, to his presence in you. So let's let him lead us and fill us with his joy. That's the prayer that I have for my own soul. That's the prayer that I have for my family, for my wife, my daughters, my son. And that's the prayer that I have for you. May it be so. Well, dailyradiobible.com is our home base out here in these interwebs, and that's where you are always welcome to stop by. We'd love to hear from you. We'd love to find out who you are, where you're from, how you stumbled upon the podcast. All of it just makes us happy. So the next time you got a moment, you take it and let your brother Hunter know. Hey, there's things I want you to know. One is we have a newsletter that comes out about once a month, and we would love for you to get it. It's free, and it is the only God-ordained newsletter on the Internet. And if you believe that, well, I have some swampland I want to talk to you about. (laughs) No, it's not a God-ordained newsletter. It is a newsletter, and we do like to honor God in it, no doubt. But uh, we'd love for you to get that. It's a way for us to connect with you further. It's a way for us to encourage you. It's a way for us to to bless you, to say thank you. So, So sign up for the newsletter. The other thing I want to do is give a big shout out and say thank you to our supporters. This podcast is entirely supported by you, listeners to the podcast. These are folks that have come alongside and said, Hey, Hunter and Heather, we believe in what's going on here and we want to play a part. And that is so amazing and we are so humbled and we're so grateful. So a big shout out and a big thank you to Charlotte Brody, my old classmate Deanne Norton, Karina Foley, Daniel Dodera, Vanessa Kaufman, Gerald Quinn, Calhoun Queener, Kayla Brands, and my old neighbors, Bob and Sue Bastiani. Bless you, my friends, co-laborers in the work of the Lord. And if you're listening to this and you would like to partner with us, you certainly can. Just head on over to the webpage, dailyradiobible.com, and click on that donate link. Or you can click on the link right in the show notes of this podcast and you'll be on your way. And before I go ahead and fire away and close up this podcast, just want to tell you that I appreciate all of you. So grateful, so honored to have you on this journey with Heather and myself. And we just look forward to to this next year. You know, we're at the beginning of things and I'm feeling very encouraged and I'm grateful to be able to, to share this time together with you. So what do you say we show up again here tomorrow and we'll do it again? Lord willing and the creek don't rise, I plan on being here. Until that time, let's go forward in God's joy. Let's let his joy be our strength. And let us always remember this, that you are loved. No doubt about it. 
All righty. I'll talk to you again tomorrow. You guys take care.